Well, I'm pretty excited about your participation in this course and kicking off module number two, because I've talked so far about various viewpoints or understandings of parts and parts work. Now I'm going to share with you my conceptualization, the way I see parts and how it is that I work with my clients. And I think you're really going to like the model that I'm going to share with you. So it's super important that right below this video, you click the link to open up the PDF. That PDF is, of course, these board notes. And even though you can see this here in the video, I want you to be able to hold this in your hand. I want you to print it out uh, because this is going to become what I think is truly a great resource for you. Now, as we talk about parts and parts therapy and different therapists and different theorists, what you'll see is that some people have come up with creative names for their parts. So, for example, Schwartz had our exiles and our firefighters and our managers, and others have conceptualized these parts with various names. I would actually prefer to simply ask my client, what do you call that part, and discover what it is that they call them rather than giving them a label from my perspective or from my vantage point. But the way I conceptualize parts and the different parts that we're going to work with, you're going to see integrate into a system. And uh, by integrating it into a system, we're able to create interventions, hypnotic suggestions, both indirect and, in, uh, and, and direct suggestions, as well as processes that are truly helpful. So I don't have in my conceptualization of parts cute names for each of these things. But I think it is important to recognize that I'm going to talk about five parts. And each one of these parts has a core concept behind it. And so the first of these parts is the physical us. One of the things I've noticed in a lot of different models of parts therapy is that it almost always, they almost always neglect the physical component of who we are. And this physical aspect, I think, is inseparable from the spiritual aspect or from the psychological aspect. I, I, I actually think mind, body, spirit are, are, are really on a continuum and an extension of each other. And so I like to conceptualize parts therapy, recognizing that the physical aspect, that there are parts of us that are literal, actual parts. And the reason why this is important is your clients will come to you and they will say, a part of me hurts. This could hurt from emotional pain. It could hurt from a medical issue. Uh, it could hurt because of, uh, 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 because of uh, some uh, temporary experience they're having, or it could be something that's an ongoing chronic problem. As hypnotists, we know that the most well-researched use of hypnosis, and we've got all the, the journal articles, there are, 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 are tens of thousands of journal articles that show that hypnosis is a first-line intervention. It's a helpful tool for physical conditions, for psychological and emotional conditions, uh, for behavioral change, for peak performance, for uh, helping a person to really engage in a variety of different solutions in their life. But probably the most well-researched application or use of hypnosis is in hypnotic pain control. So you're going to have clients who are coming to you and a part of them literally uh, is in pain, either chronic pain or acute pain or episodic pain. Uh, and, and, and we're affected emotionally by our physical condition. I can only function emotionally as well as I can function physically. Years ago, I um, worked at a. Uh, I, I was working out at a gym. I, I was a, a customer, and I worked out with a personal trainer. And this gym where I worked out had a relationship with a rehabilitation hospital that was directly next door. And there was a tunnel that went from their building into our building. And uh, their patients would be over in the gym actually doing some rehab and some work, some strength training and those sorts of things. One day I was all the way across the gym and I was working with my trainer and, and I watched a person. I, he was probably 400, 450 pounds. And he was on the treadmill walking very, very slowly. And the trainer was standing next to him on the treadmill and as I was working out, I just watched what was going on across the gym. I, I never talked to them. I don't know what was really going on, but I had a light bulb go off in my head. And I realized that that trainer had just done a therapy session. Uh, but rather than talking about making change, that trainer had actually engaged in change with the client. Uh, so I thought to myself, Instead of in my office talking about these things, what if I put a treadmill in my office? I bought a treadmill. I put it in my office. And with some of my clients, I would actually have them walk on the treadmill, putting into action with their physical part uh, as we discussed and as we 
um, uh, found solutions for the emotional problems uh, that they brought to my office. It was probably one of the biggest changes I made. I think that was in 2004 or 2005. And ever since then, uh, in fact, I went on from there and actually got certified as a personal trainer, not so I could work as a trainer, but because I realized that I didn't know what I needed to know about the relationship between physical wellness and emotional health. And I'm much more aware of that. So my conceptualization of parts begins with the first part, which is our physical self. The, the next part uh, is, is what I call associated. Now, anybody who's familiar with NLP knows that an associated state is one where a person is actively participating. This is their present experience. They are associated into an emotion or a resource state or an experience or an awareness. And when I conceptualize the part of it, the part of us that's associated, I'm conceptualizing the part that is present, the part that is engaged, the part that is fighting off a problem or the part that is implementing a solution. And so the associated parts are those that are, if we want to use Freud's model of the conscious and the unconscious mind, uh, that are uh, at the top of our awareness level. So we have associated parts, and these are our primary, these are front and center. And they could be, from a personality perspective, uh, our guardian. Um, it could be guarding us, by the way, with positive coping strategies or unhealthy coping strategies, but it's still serving that purpose because it's always on guard. So we have associated parts. The next thing we have is we have what I would call the repressed parts. Now, this is different than repressed memory. A lot of people are interested in the subject of repressed memory, and there's been a lot of misinformation about repressed memory. The fact of the matter is um, that uh, 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 many of my clients' traumas, their problem isn't that they can't remember their trauma. Their problem is that they're associated into it and they're living their trauma. So this is not uh, repression as in repressed memory. This is repressed parts. These are the uh, the attributes or the characteristics of our personality. Uh, these are the members of our personality that, unlike the associated parts, are not at the forefront. They're in the background. They're present. They're there. We can tap into them at any time. But it's not our first inclination. It's not our, our, our first response. They're, they're often second to the scene. And, uh, and each one of us has parts that are repressed or held back or... Uh, and, and this can be held back from a number of different reasons. It could be that they're not strong yet. But one of our goals in therapy is to strengthen these parts. It could be that this part is consumed with fear. And because it's con consumed with fears, it, it's taking the background and letting another part take the lead and be associated in that particular moment. But we have these repressed parts. We have other parts that are the team. These are the, the helpers. If you want to put it in the context of IFS, uh, these are the firefighters. These are the, the parts of us that come along and say, hey, you need to come to the front or you need to step to the back um, uh, uh, or, or you need to take care of your physical self so that we can actually solve this problem, which is in front of us. So we have these team members and these team members are the parts of our personality that play a role really integrating and bringing these different parts together. And the last one here, the, the fifth uh, a part in, in my conceptualization of parts that I work with when I'm working with my clients most of the time is the symbolic self. This is, uh, if you want to put it in the context of Freud, this could be the, the super ego. Uh, this is where the, uh, the moralistic part is, the spiritual part is, uh, the legalistic part is. Uh, this is where the religious part of us lies. Uh, there are, are, are many elements of this symbolic self. This is the person who finds meaning in ritual. Now, when we think of ritual, we think of, you know, uh, uh, an Orthodox priest with, you know, incense and smoke, or we think of, you know, jostics in the Buddhist temple and uh, the burning of incense, or we think of, you know, a rosary bead or prayers. And, and those are all rituals that can be a part of the symbolic self. But people engage in habit, and habit is ritual. Habit lies in the part of us that's symbolic. We compulsively smoke cigarettes, bite our fingernails, crack our knuckles, who I actually did crack my knuckles there. These habits that we have, because they are symbolic for us, they serve a purpose for us, even though 
they don't really serve a purpose in the grand scheme of things. We've attached a meaning to it that serves our purposes. So we have these five parts that are primary and uh, and you'll notice something, it spells out an acronym. So you can easily remember it, P, physical, A, associated, R, repressed, T, team, and S, symbolic. These are our parts. But I've used my art abilities here and I've drawn a tree. And the reason why I've drawn a tree is this is your parts family tree. These are the, the, the parts of us that are primary, but each part of this has, if you want to use this metaphor or analogy, has children. So you can see I've structured it like a family tree. And there are probably three or more parts of our physical self. There are probably three or more associated parts that are present in any given situation. People are complex. There's probably three or more repressed parts. There's probably three or more team players. There's probably three or more symbolic selves that are represented by each one of these five sort of archetypes or, 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 you know, the, the top dogs here. Now, I, I've written something here in red, and you probably can't see it on the board, but you can see it underneath here. I've written P-A-C, 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 and I've written I-E-S, I-E-S, I-E-S. We could conceptualize this model in conjunction with other models. One of the things I want to stress to you is that everything works together. If you were going to write a book about Richard Donyard, one of the presuppositions of Richard Donyard is that everything works together, no matter how chaotic it may seem. So we can actually take my conceptualization, physical, associated, repressed, team, symbolic, and we can look at the parts of each one of these parts, and we can see that one of these parts was perhaps the parent, the adult, and the child. One of these associated parts, let's say it's the part of, back to the example of sort of the sentry, the guardian, right? Uh, one is the parent, one is the adult, one is the child, right? We can take the, 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 the repressed part. Um, this could be the part of me that has shame, right? So I'm going to call this part shame, right? What, what do you call that part? Your clients will come up with a name for their parts. It might be a, an actual name like Shane in this case, because it sounds like the part of shame or it'll come up with something else like, you know, the Muppet part or, you know, the, the, the iced tea part. I don't know. They'll come up with all kinds of different labels for it. So rather than me coming up with labels for the parts, I asked them, what, what does that part call itself? What, what do you call that part? That can be really revealing. And I think better than the approach of telling the clients what the parts are named. So I, I think that's important. But back to our re repressed person, we have this part that has shame. There's a part of Richard with shame. And I call this part shame because no matter where I go, shame is always there. And, and shame is no fun. Shame is always telling me that... I shouldn't do this or I can't do that. And, and the reason why is because it would be embarrassing or humiliating and that would be the worst thing ever. And so I listened to Shane way too much rather than listening to, to, to another part of me. And, and that part uh, uh, is one of the team players. I call him, you know, Coach B. And, uh, and, and Coach B is, is one of the team players who's always telling me, you know, uh, 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 hey, uh, you need to have Shane you know, move up to the front line in the game and, and play defense. So, so we have, we can have a, a, a child, a parent, and an adult for each one of these different parts of the bigger part. Or back to Freud's conceptualization, we can have an id, an ego, and a superego. We can have an id, an ego, and a superego. We can have an id, an ego, and a superego. We can have an id, an ego, and a superego for each one of these. And you won't be wrong. And the reason why you won't be wrong is because one of the presuppositions of hypnosis is that clients will attach the meaning to these ideas that are most important to them. And sometimes they'll attach meanings to the sessions you do that are even different than what you thought about or what you came up with. Now, rather than using the parent, uh, adult, child, or the 
id, the ego, and the superego, I almost always take a look at the parts of our, uh, our, our parts in context of the past me, the present me, and the future me. And my goal in the therapy that I'm doing is often to move our past into the present and the future into the present. And the reason why is simple. Much of our therapeutic approaches, this is really, again, based on Sigmund Freud, uh, is to go back and revisit the past. But no matter how much time we spend on the past, the reality is we can't change the past. We have to recognize the past. The past brings us to where we are today. Uh, so having an understanding of the past is important. And searching for the initial sensitizing events, the ISE, is actually a useful tool in relapse prevention. But I don't think it's a very useful tool, regress to cause, to help people make change. I think we can help people make change without ever knowing why we do the things that we do. Most of my clients, their problem is they are either stuck in the past. They're, they're not living in the present moment. They have regrets. They have fears. They have a lot of different parts of them that they've carried from the past. And so I conceptualize these parts as the parts of the past and ask the question, how in therapy can we move forward into the present? Now, some of my clients who aren't stuck in the past, regret, remorse, um, uh, 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 self-flagellation, these types of things that we see. Um, uh, my clients are often stuck in the future. These are my anxiety and my panic and my, my fear-based clients. What if, what if, what if? They can't live in the moment because a part of them is always projecting into the future. Well, the great master Uwe said it best. He said, yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery. All we have is the present, and that's why it's a gift. So my predominant approach, whether it's therapy or counseling or really any other coaching strategy, is to help people to, to, to move these parts to the present moment so that all of these parts together can be here and now. If all of these parts are here and now and they are resources to me, I can actually solve just about anything. I can do things with all of my parts that I can't do with just one part or another part. It's kind of like if if my car were to run out of gas, uh, uh, you know, six blocks away, there's a gas station about six blocks from where I'm standing. If it was to run out of gas in my driveway, I can't push it down the little part of my street and then onto the big busy road and then get it across the median over to the gas station. I can't do that by myself. But if all of us who are watching this video, we're here right now. Let's say there were 50 or 60 or 70 of us. Can we all get behind my Ford Expedition and can we push it the six blocks to the gas station? We can do that together. Uh, you might not be happy about pushing Richard's truck, but we could do it. And we can do things together that we can't do alone, which is why when we get all of these parts together in the present moment using contextual approaches, acceptance and commitment therapy, mindfulness-based stress reduction, solution-focused brief therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, other approaches that focus on the present rather than resolving the past, I find that these parts can all function together in a resource state that can make the possibilities for our clients' experiences truly unlimited. Now, there's something else I want you to notice about this conceptualization of parts and parts therapy. And that conceptualization is we, we hear about the uh, uh, mind, body, and spirit. And I want you to notice that what we really have here is body, mind, these three, and spirit, the metaphysical aspects of our experiences. This is a holistic understanding. I put that here on the board, body, mind, and spirit. I don't know if you can see the board that low there. But, uh, but when we talk about doing holistic therapy, where we see a person not as an isolated uh, problem or an isolated part, but as a whole, uh, from a praxeological perspective, 
we can do great things with those clients. And this model of parts work in hypnosis is a model that I think we can explore and that we can build on to truly find benefit for our clients. In fact, I'm looking forward to our Zoom room because in our Zoom room, I'm going to be laying out for you a set of strategies that use this family tree of the parts to help us create um, uh, suggestions that can truly impact the clients that we work with. I'm going to give you a process that, that brings all of these parts together into the present moment. And I think you're going to discover it's a powerful process that, uh, uh, that we can use with just about any client who comes in our office or that we meet with on Zoom to help them live their best life. And that's really the promise of hypnosis. The promise of professional hypnosis is that when your clients learn hypnosis, when they come to see you, the problems they've had uh, begin to disappear. They, they discover a, a new freedom, a new way of, of managing life. Uh, they, they discover new opportunities they didn't know before. And by, by having this model, which I think is a really functional model of parts, as sort of our foundation, we can, we can then take our other learnings from IFS or from transactional analysis or from Sigmund Freud or really from any other understanding of parts work and do great things with the clients who we work with.